We're here with Carolyn Overington, author of I Came to Say Goodbye, her second novel. Um, it's an incredible novel. It's one that stayed with me after I put it down for about 30 minutes. I couldn't move. I was stunned. And it poses a number of questions. So Carolyn, welcome. Thank you. And thanks for ask, answering some of our questions. Tell me a little bit about I Came to Say Goodbye. The novel starts with a woman walking into a hospital ward in the middle of the night and from the babies that are lying there asleep she selects one, removes it from the hospital and drives away with it. So the question is who is she? Why is she doing what she's doing and what has happened to that child? That's what the novel explores. Can you tell us briefly about the different characters in the book? Well the book starts with Med who's the, the father and the grandfather of the child um, and he has three children, so there's Paul and there's Cat. They're born quite close together in the 70s, and then there's Fat, who's born much, much later, and she's the accident, as they used to be called. Um, uh, his wife, Pat, disappears from the book quite early, of course, because she abandons uh, the, um, the marriage. Um, but it's essentially the, the dramas with this family that the, the book is centred around. At the beginning of the book, a woman abandons her family. Can you tell us why she does this? Well, the earliest chapter of the book is set in the 1970s, the early 1970s, at about a time in Australia where the feminist movement um, swept through many of the country and suburban areas, and indeed the cities as well, led by feminists uh, such as Dr Germaine Greer, who was in Melbourne at the time. Um, and there were uh, great public rallies in, in Sydney from women um, who were uh, demonstrating for more rights for women. In those days, you had to leave your employment if you got pregnant, um, if you worked for the Commonwealth public service and you were married, you were expected to leave your job. So it was a very exciting time for a lot of women. And I think that what happens to this character, Pat, in the beginning is she has her two children um, in the 60s and she's just finding her feet as an adult in the world. She's uh, back at university, she's uh, concentrating on what she's going to do with the rest of her life and then she falls pregnant again. And she's just devastated because she really feels she's starting to see a life outside the home. Um, and now she's pushed back to the world of nappies and cots and feeding and uh, it's too much for her and she leaves. The family bestow a nickname on one of their children, Donna Fay, of fat. What sort of impact do you think this had on the child? You know, it was interesting to me that she ended up with that nickname because I think it was in fact very affectionate. I think that uh, she was a, a chubby, lovely baby um, and around the time that she's being raised, A Country Practice is the biggest show on TV in Australia. And there's, of course, Fatso the Wombat, which everybody loved. Um, and the way she crawls around on the floor re reminds her family of, uh, of Fatso the Wombat. And so they give her this kind of cute nickname. Um, and is often the case with families. It sticks with her even as she gets older. Um, and I think that the impact of that doesn't occur to them. It doesn't occur to them until much later. Um, how this might have affected her view of herself and her sense of self-worth. Uh, Fat's dad, Med, is a wonderful character and a lot of the book is, is from his point of view. He has difficulties with teenage Fat. Would it have been any different if Pat had been around? Well, it's interesting, isn't it, because we always assume that um, if a family is uh, broken down, then uh, that will have an impact on the children. It's almost always the father who's absent. Um, it's been very rare in Australia for fathers to win the right to raise children. Um, and in fact, the few times that has happened, the mother has had to have been such a terrible person, an alcoholic or a drug addict, or, or she abandons the family. It, it's almost never the case that it's considered in the best interest of the child to be with dad. But it does seem to me that Med does a pretty good job, given that Fat is a really unusual child. Um, and I hope it's clear from the book that even in her uh, very young days, she uh, has some special problems. There are er very early signs that things are not all well with her. Um, and of course that precedes her, her great breakdown in her early 20s. Um, it's often the case with people who have, an, have a breakdown in their early 20s that there are signs when they were younger um, that an inability to concentrate at school, an inability to make friends, often feeling a bit um, out of it with their peer group, often the one that's teased. Um, and it's because they have um, real problems running through their mind. Um, the mind isn't working properly. And given all of that, I think he does a pretty good job. As a young woman, uh, Fat has a child, Seth, and something happens to Seth. What do you make of the Welfare Department's decision to remove Seth from his mother's care? 
Well, you know, that was interesting to me that they decided to do that because it was never clear that she actually had anything to do with the injury to Seth. She was obviously out working, st um, stacking the shelves at Coles at the time when he became injured. Um, there is a school of thought in Australia at the moment now that um, some parents, not all parents, but some parents might shake a baby. And if the inju injury is not catastrophic, um, it's not a bad idea for the baby to go home because maybe it would happened in the first 10 weeks when they're just so tired and they have no idea what they're doing and the baby won't stop screaming and it was a moment of madness. Um, to take that child away and send it in and out of foster homes that never really knows where it belongs, no one you know, committed to it by blood ties and, and genuine love, um, is not necessarily the best outcome. If you can go back to the parents and say, well, look, what you've done here is, is outrageous, it's monstrous, you cannot treat a baby that way and give them the skills they need, then maybe there's a way to hold the family together. And I thought that there was a possibility for Fat in particular to help her stay with her son, not just take him away and put him in limbo but to help her learn to look after him because she's obviously not um, an extremely bright girl. Um, but they chose not to do that and I think that the impact on, on, of that was catastrophic on her. In Australia, most child and family court proceedings are held in secret. Do you support this policy or should the media be allowed to report on these matters provided the identity of the parties is protected? Well, you know, it's interesting because I've always thought to myself that the identity of people needed to be protected in family court matters because they are very private and it does involve children. And then just um, recently, this year, we've, we've seen this case where a man um, has lost his child in a custody battle and then the child's been taken overseas and, and he's been so public and the child has been so public. And you know what? The world has not fallen in. So we know his name, we know her name, we know the child's name, we've seen pictures of them. We understand that there is a custody dispute. She says something happened, he says something happened. And you know what? No, it, you know, it's not the end of the world. So the big, the big um, argument has always been, oh, it has to be secret. But why does it have to be secret? Because they're just people like us with the same problems as everybody else has. How important is it for children to know something about their own culture if they are brought up by parents from another culture? Look, it's critically important, I think, that they learn something about their culture. I, I'm not entirely sure that they need to be raised um, with people of the same culture. Um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely convinced about that. It is clear to me that they need to know something of their culture. I do know quite a lot of families in Australia who have adopted children from overseas, and they're clearly not of the same culture. They've adopted children, for example, from the Bosnian orphanages or from the famine in Ethiopia, um, who, who are orphans, who have no parents. Um, and the idea that uh, that they are not in a better situation seems to me to be a bit odd. So this is obviously a, a, a difficult area for people um, and it's particularly difficult for Australians because so many Aboriginal children were removed from their parents and placed in the care of white couples and in recent years we've started to hear that that was, um, that was awful for them, that they never really understood their connection to the land and their connection to their tribe and it was critically important to them. Um, we, are, we do understand that but I do worry that sometimes um, children are left to languish in orphanages without um, anyone to care for them because of this kind of idea that they have to be with somebody from their own race. Why do you think Fat does what she does near the end of the book? Could it have been predicted? I, I think it, I mean, perhaps not the enormity of it, perhaps was not predictable, but um, it, it is clear that she is a, um, a mentally unstable woman um, and that uh, is not brought about by alcohol abuse or by drug abuse, but she has a um, a paranoia and a and a, um, a a disturbance in her brain that um, makes it very difficult for her to, to properly understand what's going on around her. Um, it her father Med tries so hard to get her the help she needs, um, but the fact is in Australia that we just don't have the services. And anybody who has been associated with mental health will tell you that um, they cannot get a bed, they cannot get a caseworker, they cannot get a, a proper diagnosis, they um, can't get the services that they need. And very often, um, like Med, they're left to try and manage on their own, and it's just impossible to know um, whether or not these. Um, these people are going to, to do something terrible or not. Um, it is really important to say though, and I want to be you know, so clear about it, that um, the likelihood that a person who has a mental disturbance will harm themselves is much, much higher than the likelihood that they will harm anybody else. And I wouldn't want to get into um, 
stigmatising um, people who have a mental illness that they are in fact dangerous because they pose uh, the greatest danger to themselves. The book takes the form of letters from various characters to a family court judge. Why did you choose to tell the story in this way? Well, I mean, let's have a look at Med. He's a, he's a country guy and he's, he's, a, he's grown up um, in Foster out on the New South Wales coast. He's not the kind of guy that would write a book. I, I just don't believe he was the kind of guy who would write a book. Um, but he, he had something that he wanted to say to the judge. Um, he, his family has been back and forward to court and lawyers and, and goodness knows what else and he feels like he's never had an opportunity to put their side of the story. Um, and so he sits one sits down one night and writes it, and and he gets a bit of help from his daughter, who obviously has her point of view as well. Um, but it, it just it would have seemed a bit odd to me to have a first person narrative like him telling the story in a book, um, because he just never I don't think in the entire book he ever reads a book, <laughs> so it didn't seem to me that he would be the kind of person to write a book. But certainly he was the kind of person to write a letter.